Professor Devesh Kapoor from Johns Hopkins University. I will first give a very brief outline of the PK Corp Allocation Memorial Lecture Series, and then I will introduce our distinguished speaker for this, half, this evening, Professor Devesh Kapoor. Uh, Dr. PK Corp Allocation uh, was one of the persons who was instrumental in setting the Center for Development Studies way back in the, uh, the early 1970s. He has done his master's in so, uh, social studies from the Institute of Social Studies at the uh, Hague, the Netherlands, and then later on went to do a PhD in economics at the University of Amsterdam, working under Professor Jan Tinbergen, one of the Nobel laureates in economics. Okay. And after returning to uh, back to Caroline, uh, Dr. Gobarakishan was instrumental in a number of activities. In fact, he, along with the, one of the previous chief ministers, uh, Sri Achida Menon, was instrumental in setting up a string of laboratories and research institutions in the state of Kerala to support public policy making. Okay. And in fact, he started this uh, practice of evidence based policy making way back in the 1970s when this was not at all in current currency. Okay. And he was also instrumental in setting up the Science, Technology and Environment Committee in the state of Kerala for the first time, and which later on became the Kerala State Council for Science, Technology and Environment. And he also formulated the first science and technology policy for the state of Kerala, which as you know, is one of the first uh, science and technology policy at the state level in India. Okay. So, uh, and he was the, also the plan, planning and economic affairs secretary for a number of years from 1974 until 1980. And he was also a member secretary of the uh, Kerala State Planning Board. Okay. And the family of uh, Dr. Pika Gobalakrishnan has been very generous and they have been uh, instrumental in establishing this lecture, lecture series. And the, the current one, which we are going to have today by Professor Kapoor is the 10th in the series. Okay, so we are extremely grateful to the family, which is uh, represented by his uh, daughter, uh, Dr. Letha, who is also present in the audience. Now, uh, we are extremely happy that uh, Professor Devesh Kapoor has agreed to deliver the 10th PK Gobalakrishnan Memorial Lecture. Professor Kapoor, as you know, is a political scientist of extreme uh, reputation. He is uh, currently the Star Foundation Professor of uh, South Asian Studies and director of the Asian uh, Asia programs at the Paul Needs School of Ad, uh, Advanced International Studies at the Johns Hopkins University in uh, the US. Okay, and uh, uh, his uh, PhD, uh, actually he's an engineer turned political scientist. His uh, BTEC in chemical engineering is from uh, IIT BHU in Varanasi, and then later on he went on to do a chemical engineering from the University of Minnesota and then did his PhD in public policy from Princeton University in the US. And, uh, and he has worked in a number of universities, University of Texas at Austin, and then at uh, uh, the Brookings Institution, Harvard University, and also at the University of Pennsylvania, which was his uh, previous uh, assignment was at the University of Pennsylvania, where he directed the School of Advanced International Stud uh, School of uh, Center for Advanced International Studies. Indian studies at studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. His research is in five different areas. Okay. And, uh, and, and all those five areas, when I look at, they are very much close to the kind of research which is being done at uh, the Center for Development Studies. So we are very fortunate in having uh, uh, Professor Kapoor. He readily agreed to give this lecture. And in fact, he was supposed to come here in person and deliver this lecture. But unfortunately, the coronavirus has decided that it's going to be a virtual one. And nevertheless, despite his heavy teaching schedule, he has agreed to come. And this is very early in, in, in time for him. He's based in Washington, D.C., and it's only 8 a.m. there. And uh, a very kind of him to have uh, a volunteer to give this lecture at this uh, very early timing. Okay. He has an excellent publication record. I don't, I don't need to go into the details of all his uh, uh, publications. All that I would say is that in the very recent Journal of Economic Perspectives, he has a, he has participated in the India Symposium, and you will find this uh, paper, uh, which is also the 
uh, the the theme of the uh, today's lecture, which is why does the Indian state both fail and succeed? So, Professor Devesh Kapoor, a very warm welcome to CDS, of course, virtually, and we do hope that uh, you will be able to visit us uh, maybe uh, you know after the vaccinations have all been gone through and in-person activity is uh, going to be resumed. Okay, so I now over to you and. You have uh, about an hour to deliver the 10th PK Gopalakrishnan Memorial Lecture. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, P Professor Mani. Uh, I uh, thank you for inviting me to deliver the 10th PK Gopalakrishnan Memorial Lecture. Uh, when I had accepted the invitation, I had thought it would allow me to meet you and your colleagues and learn like from you all. But regrettably, uh, that has not been possible. Uh, my talk today speaks to some of the issues that uh, uh, preoccupied Mr. Gopal Krishnan during his distinguished professional career. Uh, and so I hope in that spirit, uh, I'll just begin my talk. Uh, <clears throat> So my talk is going to have sort of basically broadly, you know, in sort of, in sort of three parts. Uh, I'll first sort of give a very broad overview on the performance of the Indian state. Much of that material will not be particularly new like to y'all, uh, but it's just to set the stage. The second is uh, I'll sort of sort of lay out six explanations, uh, which plausibly speak to this varying performance, uh, India's, our historical legacy, the fact that we are a low income country, the nature of the fiscal state, uh, some sense of the size and structure of the Indian state that affects outcomes. Uh, uh, fifth, uh, India as a precocious democracy, which I'll explain. And then to ask the question, to what extent uh, are the weaknesses of the Indian straight state a sort of reflection of Indian society itself. And then I will conclude by asking this question that is state building at very large scales, nation building in very heterogeneous societies, doing both to, through democratic means, uh, has that ever been possible simultaneously? And has that happened well? So just to to lay out some of the background of the performance of the Indian state. So we know that in, in quite a few areas, it's been surprisingly sort of impressive. Uh, we conduct elections for 900 million voters. Well, if you see what's happening in the United States, it speaks just, that's how it sort of reminds us just how well we do this, you know, we can send uh, uh, very cost-effective space programs like our mission to Mars. Uh, we broadly can do a census for 1.3 billion people plus, which we're gonna do next year. Uh, we can now have the ability to scale up programs at very large scales, Aadhaar, GST. Yes, there are issues in all of them, but by and large, uh, I think it speaks to a, a fairly impressive performance. At the same time, we we know that we actually fail in relatively simple tasks, primary education, public health, water, sanitation. We have been reasonably effective in managing uh, the state. Indian state has been effective in managing one of the world's largest armed forces but much less effective in managing, you know, the, the sort of front line, the bureaucracies of the Indian state. Now, when you look at the large literature on the Indian state, there is a lots and lots of micro studies on different parts of the Indian state. And they are, they are sort of replete with the failings and flailings of the Indian state. They argue that so many of the policies are sort of rent seeking. There are programs that fail to deliver meaningful outcomes. Implementation is often weak. 
uh, <coughs> politicians and bureaucrats uh, enrich themselves. And underlying all this is this discrimination against certain social groups, uh, whether on caste, on religion, or on gender. Now, nonetheless, the fact is that if you step back and look at our macro performance, uh, just on the very basic, the most basic thing of life expectancy, if you look at India's performance relative to the world, the gap between India and the world in life expectancy has 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 fairly sharply declined from 12.6 years uh, in 1950 to about uh, just about above three years uh, in 2019. Uh, in the last 40 years, that's a fairly long period of time. Uh, India's growth at about five percent has been India has been among the ten fastest growing so economies. Uh, so if you look at the performance over 70 years, if you look at you know very basic things that, that, that matter from literacy, life expectancy, maternal mortality, per capita income, in all of them, the glass is at least half full, right? We can we obviously know that India could and should have done better, but at least I think one has to say that the performance has been has been at least modestly good. Uh, if we look at just uh, broad social indicators, uh, and this is data from the last three uh, NFHSs, uh, we know the NFHS five is just being released. But if you see, you know, again, these are not about income, but about the basics that provide uh, uh, the quality of life, households with electricity or drinking water, infant mortality and female literacy. In all of them, uh, we see that in the past uh, two, 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 two decades, there have been steady improvements, not spectacular, but fairly steady. Two areas that, that I want to highlight, which are the bottom two columns. One is the sex ratio. Uh, we know almost no improvement. Uh, and this sort of speaks to the sort of theme that I'll come back later, the extent to which the failures of the Indian state are rooted in practices and behaviors of Indian society. The last is something which I, which I will sort of begin with next, is a very basic sort of indicator again, which is the homicide rate. And this is from the NFHS and you see uh, you know, despite all our thing about violence in India, that actually there's been a fairly steady and actually quite significant decline in violence as measured by its core indicator, which is uh, which is which is homicide. And I'll be, and I'll begin with that indicator just to illustrate about some of the things that have been happening. So homicide rates actually have been falling in all parts of the world. This is data from 1990 to 2015, and you know, if you if you bring it up to uh, last year, the changes will not be particularly different, like from these trends. And you see, it's fallen by about a fifth everywhere, uh, much more so in North America and Europe, uh, but in Asia as well. Uh, uh, you see, the one part where it has increased is Latin America. And that increase would be even more in Latin America over the past five years. Now, people have argued that one reason for this decline in the homicide rate, this is worldwide, is because the people who are much who are most likely to commit homicide, which is the age group 15 to 29, that has been declining sort of around the world. So two are correlated, and, and that's what. Uh, one set of explanations seems to attribute it to this this change. Now, what has happened in India? So this is the homicide rate in India, which has changed uh, since 1990, and that's about a 40 percent reduction, which is a, a fairly significant decline. If you compare India with other large countries, heterogeneous countries like ours, 
South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, US, and India. Again, you see a performance in relative terms to somewhat comparable countries as, as actually fairly positive. Uh, however, what's interesting is in India's case, it's not been because of a decline in the youth populations between uh, the age group uh, of 15 to, 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 to 29. Uh, as you can see, that age group has been pretty steady over these over the past 25 years. Now, if you look at another sort of source of violence, which is insurgency related, Kashmir, Northeast, Maoist, most of these actually peaked around the early 2000s. And even if you extend it to 2019, it's been a steady decline uh, 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 over the past quarter a century. Now, I'm sort of using violence because one of the key roles of the state absolutely has been to manage uh, violence. And we see that overall, that seems to be a reasonably sort of at least we would say a positive not hugely a performance nonetheless i think we all recognize these improvements mask uh, you know fairly uh, very poor outcomes on a range of public goods right i mean education we know the story uh, dismal school learning outcomes, half of children are supposedly in learning poverty, uh, unable to read and understand a simple text by the age of 10. Uh, more than three out of four of rural children in grade three are unable to read at grade level. If we think of health, very high levels of malnutrition and stunting. Uh, the most recent NFHS 5, uh, this data just came out last week. If you look at both stunting and underweight children, uh, the numbers are staggeringly high, despite all these supposed efforts that we have been making. Uh, on security, yes, homicide rates have declined, but I think we all recognize that the perception, there is a very strong perception and reality of severe insecurity among women and minorities in particular. If you look at environment, whether air quality or pollution levels are one of the worst in the world, water, we know what's happening to, to groundwater, you know, very, very uh, severe decline between in the last two decades. Most of our sewage is untreated. Most of the solid waste is also untreated. So <clears throat> what is the state good at? Now here are, I'm gonna show you two slides, very simple ones, uh, where I'm, I'm, I'm placing India's performance relative to other comparator groups. Right? So if you look at uh, relative to, because of course we have to look at performance relative to a country's aggregate income levels, and there you see actually on the provision of electricity uh, that India's perform does better than what might expect given its uh, uh, per capita income. However, when you look at open defecation relative to our income, we perform much, much worse. And the question, right, which in this talk I, I want to explore with you is why do we better do better on the first, relatively speaking, and much worse on the second, again, relatively speaking. So the argument I'm gonna make is that the Indian state is good in activities that are episodic with automatic exit. Elections, census, polio drive, finance commission, by and large, these, are activities that occur within short periods of time and after that the activity is done. The state is better in providing those public goods that don't interact with social cleavages. 
Uh, these could be national public goods like inflation, debt exchange rate management, uh, better at electricity, but much worse at open defecation because we know how much the latter is linked to our caste system. So it's better at providing goods that do not involve behavioral changes in society, which is hard infrastructure, we can do metros well, have highways well. Uh, and increasingly, the state seems to be able to leverage the technology to provide what I call private public goods, such as LPG, uh, toilets, payment systems, and so on. Now, what are some explanations for this varying outcomes? So one is uh, uh, our historical legacy. Now, one of the things that, you know, this is obviously one can give a entire lecture books on our historical legacy. I'll just focus on one, which is, you know, two factors have been critical if you look at state building around the world. Absolutely fundamental, which is war and taxation. There's this famous line by Charles Tilly that states make wars and wars make states. And the reasoning being that winning wars requires resources. And the demand for those resources requires the state to build tax system to extract those resources to fight the wars if it has to win. So taxation provides the fiscal sinews of state building. Now, compare India's record with our giant neighbor, China, right? Now, one of the things you see in China, and this is uh, <clears throat> for about 150 years of mid 19th century to about 1970, in the case of China, what you see is the spectacular amount of conflict that China went through over 150 years with deaths that almost total close to 100 million people. Uh, it's just a massive amount of war and casualty. You know, if you look, of course, at European history from about 1500 to uh, the World War II, you again see much more spectacular uh, amount of wars and deaths and conflict. Uh, now, in our case, that has actually been much rarer than we think. We always think of partition, of course, as being you know, spectacular. Uh, but relative to China, relative to Europe, you know, where we think that state building has been successful, war at least has not been a, at all a part of our story in any significant way. Just to illustrate, even after both India and China became independent, you know, in the first week of the Korean War, when China entered, China had more casualties than India's entire casualties the Indian Army has suffered since independence, including all wars, all insurgencies, everything combined. What we lost in 70 days, China lost in one week. That's the sort of spectacular difference that you see between a China and India in this regard. Now, I'll come back to the taxation implications of this conflict, but let me first sort of just take us to what might be the most basic ex explanation, right? Which is we are a low income country, low income countries have weaker states, uh, <clears throat> greater income and state building go hand in hand. Uh, of course, we can argue uh, about the causality, but by and large, we know that richer countries have stronger states, poor countries have weak states. So while our per, uh, per capita incomes have been increasing and are ranking, the fact is <clears throat> India is still in the bottom quartile of countries in per capita income. Uh, Comparatively speaking, its ranking on government effectiveness puts it in the top half of countries. 
which means that relative to our income, in comparative terms, the Indian state seems to perform relatively better. Because here, of course, we have to ask is, you know, when we think of performance, better, worse, it's not just about issue area, but re relative to other countries of similar levels of income. So this has been our, you know, how our percent, how we've improved in per capita income. We were not even in the top fifth, uh, oh, sorry, we were in the bottom fifth uh, in the early 90s. Now we are slowly creeping up to about about the top about the bottom of one third, but even then, as you can see, that has been a gradual increase. Still, more than two thirds of the countries in the world have higher per capita incomes than India. However, when you look at government effectiveness, this is uh, data like from the World Bank. Uh, you know, you can argue about these rankings, these numbers, but broadly speaking, what you see is that the comparator group that India is part of, which is which is lower middle income countries, which is the blue line at the bottom. Uh, India is the black line. And as you can see, relatively speaking, uh, you know, uh, all, th all through the last few decades, India's government performs better or is seems to be more effective relative to a comparator group of countries. It seems to do somewhat better than Indonesia and Brazil as well, although expectedly the effectiveness of the Chinese state is higher and the gap seems to be increasing. The third explanation that I, that I, I want to explore with you is the fiscal state. Right? And this sort of relates to the issue about what, which is, uh, uh, now, which is about you know taxation and low state capacity. Now, historically, the ability to raise revenues has been a key indicator of state capacity. You, the state cannot do much if it doesn't have resources. No one can do that much without resources, whether us, whether we as individuals, whether our institutions, or whether our government. Now, however, uh, there is broad agreement that state capacity uh, is not just about any revenues. So natural resources, rents from natural resources like oil does not build up state capacity, but really it's from taxes and even in taxes from direct taxes. So it's really about the ability of states to raise direct taxes as distinct from revenues from indirect taxes and natural resources uh, that this that is correlated with state building. So India's record on this indicator has been, as we know, fairly modest. So this is uh, the tax paying population as a percentage of total population. And as you can see, uh, we are close to the sort of bottom uh, of of countries, but you know that could well be that. Look, we are a poor country, so you do not expect people to have the capacity uh, to you know poor people to pay taxes, and that seems to be true if you control for uh, for per capita income. Uh, India's, uh, the taxpayers per population in India is about average for its per capita income. Uh, uh, you can see India on the on the sort of bottom left uh, and relative to its per capita income, you know, we are doing, we seem to be doing uh, pretty much okay. However, if you control for the fact that India is a democracy, then we seem to be doing much worse. Uh, when so here you see India is is way way below the ex where it ought to be, and that's the thing that I think I want to stress is we don't do badly relative to our per capita income, but we do badly relative to the fact that the democracies. The states are expected to deliver more to the people, 
and therefore they need to raise taxes like to do so we don't seem to to, to do so as much as might be expected now if you look at uh, between the relationship now the, 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 the why people believe that direct taxation matters is because it believes it leads to greater accountability right when people are directly taxed they the demand side for goods and services would increase that's at least the 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 broad argument that's made in the literature and here you see that that even though over time when you when you look at taxes as a share of 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 some gdp which gradually rose from the from the early 50s what really changed was that direct taxes as a share of total taxes began to sharply fall uh, from the 50s to the early 90s and that's one reason was that trade taxes became such an important part but i think the one i have sort of highlighted in red that's sort of interesting is that that at at the sub national level at state level i think that's where you see this failure of direct tax collection most manifest at the central level it's now it's broadly equal this is before the gst was introduced things have changed after that so which we can come back to later but if you see it's the states actually that under the constitution are supposed to provide the quotidian goods and services that the public needs which is you know the things we talked about the public health uh, the primary education the sanitation uh, 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 the air pollution regulation all of those things the quality of water those are all broadly constitutionally state subjects the state barely taxes barely you has uses direct taxation as a means for raising revenues and that's where the link between accountability and revenue raising seems to falter the most now another part of the explanation might be about basically the size the structure and the incentives of the indian state itself uh there have long been arguments that the indian state is too large uh it's flabby uh and of course all those issues about corruption so on and so forth uh so, so so let's just look at some of the reality there so i just want to make four points about the characteristics of the indian state on its size the indian state is one of the smallest states on a per capita basis in the world despite that it has large vacancies and these large vacancies are despite massive numbers of applications for each job and joblessness as a salient political issue there is a severe a mal distribution of government employees across the three different levels of government local state and national which i'll sh show you uh but the argument that look uh, the government uh, performs badly because recruitment is all based on patronage etc at least that argument i don't think is valid so here is some uh, here is some uh, uh, uh sorry hello Uh, so here's some public sector employment data putting india in comparative perspective right so here you see relative to our income india is a bit of an outlier in the relative low number of in public sector employment relative to india's per capita income so this is data i've put together from all the pay commission reports from uh, 1973 to the last one which was in 20 14 and what you see is right that the central government basically employment peaked around the early mid 90s and has declined since 
Uh, some parts declined, uh, like communication and IT, because uh, you know we created state-owned enterprises that moved many of them out. But overall, most parts of the central government are smaller uh, in absolute numbers uh, than they were uh, in the mid-90s. The only part which has increased is the home ministry, and this is almost entirely the very significant increase in the central armed police forces. Uh, the story is true of the railways. It's true of public sector enterprises. Uh, public sector banks peaked in the mid 90s. And in total, you see, uh, the absolute numbers peaked in the mid 90s. On uh, per capita, it's about half today what it was in the mid 90s. And per constant, uh, per unit, you know, GDP. Uh, it's about one fourth of, of what it was in the mid 90s. So you see that when it comes to the central government, uh, <clears throat> the idea that somehow the Indian state is growing, et cetera, is just not the case. Uh, public sector employment uh, basically increased. This is uh, from the from the 1960. 2012, uh, we don't have this this data uh, for some reason. Uh, we've not been keeping it since then. But at least you see the peak occurs in about uh, circa around the late 1980s. Uh, when you break it up by levels of government uh, on a per capita basis, the central government peaked in the early 1970s. Uh, local bodies. And here you see the failures of the 73rd and 74th Amendment. Despite that, local bodies have actually, employment has been declining steadily since the early 70s uh, as well. Uh, the parts of the government that continued to increase till the early 90s were really subnational, which is state government employment, and what we call quasi government. This is all these authorities, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, you know, which are which are public but are not a state in the narrowly defined way in which constitutionally we think of 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 the state. Uh, now, this is something I particularly want to highlight: is is not just about size, but where public employment is concentrated. We all think about and talk about centralization, decentralization in India. The key thing, and these are the two other large giant countries, China and the US. So these are the three largest countries in the world. And you see the spectacularly different levels, ways in which where public employment is located if you compare China and the US, which are pretty similar to India. India is a real outlier in the way that public employment and hence government centralization is at the second level of government, which is at the state level, uh, much, much lower than it ought to be at, at the local level. And that's the bottom part of the Indian U. Uh, which, as you can see in China and the US, that's where employment is most concentrated because that's where all the local public goods, it's the BDO's office in our case, it is the Tesildar's office, it's the one that you go to for land certificate, death certificate, it is the one that provides the teachers, the health workers, all of that is much more constrained in the Indian case because local level the governments do not have the human and the financial resources in a way that is very distinctive from other large you know, systems. And that is also borne out from personnel to expenditures. If you look at local government expenditures as a percentage of total government expenditures, if you just compare it to China and India, it's just night and day. 
right? Uh, and that's, I think, one of the big, big stories of why, of the sorts of areas where the Indian state struggles to improve its performance. Again, I repeat that it is because of the peculiarities in which there is huge centralization at tier two of the government, starving tier three of human and fiscal resources. Now, one might, when we look at the fact, you might say, well, you know, the central government might be small, but maybe uh, we spend a, a lot of money on their salaries and on their uh, uh, pensions. Uh, this is a graph of, of government spending and compensation relative to GDP per capita. Just look at India. You can barely see it. It's right at, at the very, very bottom. And so you see that that it is certainly not the case that somehow we are spending a lot of money on central government employees. However, when you look at total government expenditure, India is does spends as much as would be expected for a government uh, for its per capita income. So what this means is, Government spending is high or as high as ought to be given our incomes, but we are not spending it on employee compensation. And that, of course, is a big part of that expenditure compared to other countries is the extent to which we spend on subsidies, uh, which is much, much higher uh, relative to a per capita income compared to other countries. So you can, uh, we can, of course, argue whether it's good or bad, et cetera, et cetera. But that's just the uh, 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 sort of empirical you know, reality. Now, just to give you, I thought this would be an interesting thing, you know, since in India, every political party believes in the state, uh, no matter uh, what it might say. In the US, only one party believes, the other party that does not. But even then, uh, you know, the size of the US bureaucracy compared to the Indian bureaucracy is twice as much. Uh, both countries have declined, but you see the decline in the Indian case is much sharper. Now, this is, of course, partly because of the massive increase in our population, but you would expect the size of government to reflect because it has to serve more people uh, to have more employees, but that's certainly not happened in our case. And this you can see right now. I'm going to show you. This is comparing since we are part of the G20. Uh, this is just comparing on a range of indicators to other G20 countries. This is the tax bureaucracy. You can see India at the very right hand side. Uh, this is when you look at uh, courts, judges, uh, Mexico. We are just around, just above Mexico. Uh, same when you look at police. In each case, you'll see we are the least number of in whichever category you want to look at. Now, one of the points I want to make is it is not the case that, okay, you say, well, we don't recruit many, but whoever we recruit, we are, we are recruiting through dubious means. That's just not the case. All sorts of studies show that the Indian state relative to most other governments actually recruits much more uh, on the basis of, you know, certain exams. You can agree or disagree whether the exams are the right way to do it, whether it's the right exam. But the fact is you have to go through certain formal processes. Uh, this is, you know, the entire civil service of exams. And you see that over the past uh, 65 years, uh, from 1950 to 2015, barely in civil service, this is combining all of the civil services, it barely doubled the intake. Whereas the number of people taking the exam increased hundredfold, right, from about 24,000 to 2.9 million. And so, so whatever it is, uh, at least the what it shows is that it is a very selective process 
And you would expect any system where you are so selective, uh, whoever you recruit for whatever must have some positive attributes about her. Uh, when you break up that, and this is I've taken a, a sort of you know three year average from uh, 2014 through 2017, whichever part of the civil service, whether it is main civil service, forest service, engineering service, police, economic service, geologists, medical services, in most of them, it's more than 100 to 1, right? There are very few countries where you see these ratios. The only one that is, and that too is very competitive, is sort of, you know, geologists or medical services. I mean, if you see faculty applications to Harvard, you would not see the sort of selectivity that you sort of, you know, see over here. Uh, this is something I just looked at. Uh, this is India's NDA. This is the army compared to US the best point. And if you just look at the 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 applicants, uh, the admitted to applicant ratio, uh, comparing India with the US, it's not an order of magnitude. It is several orders of magnitude. You know, the selectivity in the Indian case compared to the US and you know by all accounts to the US seems to be fairly selective at least in this particular sense. Now the problem I think is well recognized that yes there are issues about how you select but the bigger issue is that the selection is really undercut by a post recruitment uh, bureaucratic incentives uh, which is that political control is exercised through what I call the transfer raj, right? And there have been a range of papers that have documented this from the irrigation bureaucracy, from teachers, health workers, the civil service, and the police, that that's how the, the political control, the rent-seeking behavior is not at the recruitment stage, but at the post-recruitment stage through this very arbitrary instrument of political control through transfers. Now, a peculiar aspect of our government is how much across all parts of government, how high vacancies are. This is vacancies in 2014 uh, from the pay commission. In I've just picked four. Uh, because these were important ministries for reforms at the time. Corporate Affairs, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of FAR, Ministry of Science and Technology, right? 40 to 47 percent vacancy rates. This is the most recent data across all central government. Group A, that is the G stands for, for gazetted. Group B, gazetted and non-gazetted. And Group C, which is where uh, what used to be class three and class four employees is now C. Uh, in all parts, you see the vacancy rates uh, overall to be close to about a fifth of central government. And this, mind you, I've already pointed out that the number of employees is actually uh, uh, not that high to begin with. This is the civil service and for reasons that are not been very clear, you see this gap between the prescribed and actual strength of IES officers that has been emerging. Uh, and this gap, the most recent year, last year, if you see, is now uh, uh, more than a fifth. It's uh, relatively more for promotion posts from the state civil service to the IES compared to direct recruits, but even there, it's fairly high. You see this in the armed forces, in the Army, Navy, Air Force, both in officer and non-officer ranks. Non-officer, it's less, but in the Navy, it's fairly high. And in the Army and Navy, in the officer rank, it's about a sixth. In the police, this is across all states, every single state except one, which is Nagaland, uh, as vacancies are about a fifth to uh, to thirty percent of the sanctioned police force, you know, forces. 
the we know how many court cases are piled up the vacancies the more again the most recent data from this november the high courts is 37 percent the district courts is about a fifth of other institutions of accountability, the CBI, the CVC, these are not large numbers, right? When you look at courts, it's not, they're not talking of, you know, half a million people. We're talking of barely 25,000. Uh, and this, if you see at the bottom, India already has the minimum, by far, uh, judges are, <coughs> are, are much lower than, say, the UK or the US. Uh, the CBI, the CVC, uh, uh, both have uh, fairly high vacancy rates. Look at something like pollution, the Central Pollution Control Board has a vacancy rates of 15%. State pollution boards have vacancy rates of 44%. Uh, is it any surprise that they're barely able to enforce anything on pollution control? So, I mean, I could have given you more, but it's just is the bottom line is that we have massive vacancies from the BDO's office, the Tessilda's office, to teachers, to health workers, all the way to the apex institutions of the Indian state, whether it's the courts uh, or the finance ministry. And the question is why? Now, in some cases you could argue, well, there are supply side issues. For instance, if we look at faculty in the IITs, uh, the vacancy rate is of one third. And having looked into this with a little more care, it's pretty clear that in lots of positions that just aren't uh, people of who are well trained enough uh, uh, that are suitable like for these jobs, and that can certainly be the case. Uh, I'll give you two examples where you would think you would. Uh, this is the exam results of the Goa government's directorate of accounts. You know, it's not a big deal. They advertised 80 positions, 8,000 people took the exam. The number of people who passed the exam was exactly zero. This is the Maharashtra primary teacher test. I've not been able to get other results, but if you look at the total number who take the exam, and this is, mind you, primary school teacher, this is not IIT. Uh, those who pass the exam is barely 1% in the primary and less than 5% in the upper primary. So here you see a very different story that, that the number of applicants is always very high, the number who can pass you know, the basics of exams. And that is, a, I think, a severe indictment of our education system that we train a lot of people but we train them very, very poorly. So we know, right, that in in when you look at these stories, you know, uh, for you know railways, uh, peon jobs in the UP police, constable jobs. I mean, you have hundreds of thousands of people applying uh, because government jobs at low levels are very, very Poverty. Now, the fifth set of explanations is around what I call precocious democracy. This is not my formulation. This was based on uh, a paper written by the former CEA, uh, Arvind, Arvind Subramanian. So this is, you know, the story uh, that about India and look at the, the comparative literature around the world, that India was the democratic so exception. This is based on quality four indexes uh, of the democracy. Uh, and two things stand out. I mean, you can argue whether the numbers are right or wrong, but when you take it over the long run, et cetera, uh, you know, I, I think it, uh, people would broadly agree on this. I mean, two things stand out, right? One is, how steady India has been relative to other countries and just how well it has done relative to other countries over this entire period. It's only since the, you know, 19, that the, you see a, a marked improvement in the OECD countries. It's not that India declined 
in a, in a market way. We all, of course, know, and I don't have to get into it, that this uh, is now under some question marks since 2014-15, uh, uh, for reasons I do not have to elaborate to you all, uh, it's clear that on a range of scores that uh, relate to India's the democracy, that they have been declining. How much lower they will go, what this means, all of that is a separate story. But by and large, I think uh, the broader story that things are different, are changing in India, I think is 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 not contested. Now, what was distinctive about our uh, universal franchise? Now, if you compare the universal franchise in the West, the, one, the very distinctive part was that in the West, the expansion was gradual. It began with first property holders, then to men, then to women, then to members of marginalized communities, right? There were all these things you had to have, literacy requirements, land requirements, all sorts of things. So economic you know, development, state building and expanding the franchise went hand in hand. If you look at East Asia, there was a very clear sequencing with universal franchise came way after protracted processes of economic development and state building. In Latin America, there was no teleology. There were periodic reversals, even as their economies grew. India is really exceptional in that the universal franchise came at levels of economic development and state building that was far below what unfolded in other parts of the world. And at least till, uh, till, till you know, recently, there have largely been no reversals. So the question is, what were the consequences for state, right, and its development? So here is the income at full franchise of, of countries which are now what we call the industrialized countries. Uh, the level at which they achieved a level of income where they had universal franchise. So on the left hand side is the income at full franchise. This look where India is compared to the other countries. On the right hand side is the, the gap the number of years between when women and men were granted the universal franchise. And again, you see that India is one of the very few countries compared to these where universal franchise was granted to both men and women at the same time. So in the Indian story here, you can see is really quite different. Now, what were the consequences now, most my argument is that most mature democracies had laid a foundation of public goods by the time universal franchise was granted. So the welfare state was built on a strong foundation of universal public goods. But in India, we've been attempting to build some sort of welfare state without first laying a strong foundation of universal public goods, which one could argue may have amplified pressures for re redistribution. So, so this is, you know, a classic public good we know is public health. So this is, and life expectancy is very much related to good public. So this is the life expectancy in the year of universal franchise. I'd shown you figures on income, but if you look at life expectancy, right? The life expectancies of, many of the countries you see here, which are the industrial country, was significantly higher when they had universal franchise because they'd already laid strong foundations of, of public health. If you look at primary school enrollment in the year when universal franchise was granted in most of these countries, they were basically above 80%. Uh, and it's whereas in our case, we were barely at 30%. You can see that India is way, way lower in 
the provision of a basic public good at a time at the time when universal franchise was granted now so what it means is that the pressures to spend and spend on consumption goods rather than investment goods is much much higher so the so the sort of spending that india does on uh, 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 that the indian state does relative to its uh, income so you see that that if you if you see south korea as an example right we all know it's a very successful country the share of government spending or government expenditure to gdp uh, so, you know south korea uh, achieved that level only when its per capita income had crossed 20000 to dollars right uh, in most other countries is about 5000 to 10000 in India is the only other country which had that high level of public spending at low incomes was Italy in 1945, which is, as we know, after the war when everything had sort of collapsed. Uh, this is my last set of explanations, which is on whether the failures of the Indian state really are a reflection in some ways of the failures of Indian society. Now, we all are well aware that that two key characteristics of, of Indian society are severe social hierarchies and multiple cleavages. And one argument is that they play a role in shaping the performance of the Indian state because of the demand side effects for symbolic goods or club goods, but much less for universal public goods. So the broad, there's a large literature which looks at state performance based on social heterogeneity, the argument being that states that are, are that in much more hetero socially heterogeneous societies have lower provision of public goods. But here I think what is different is that it's not just that we are heterogeneous, but we have such categorical social hierarchies, uh, which are socially sanctified, whether it is intergroup such as caste based or intra household such as gender inequality. And legal measures can only go so far legal measures come from the state, but they can only go so far. I think Hambedkar had it, put it very nicely when he said, caste is a mental state, therefore it cannot be eradicated through constitutional measures alone, right? It's a cognitive state. It's embedded in society's consciousness. And these mental states are what I call uh, societal failures and make state failures more likely. And especially in those policy areas, where the state is trying to redress issues which are intimately connected to those societal failures. And so the, it's not surprising that the Indian state has done poorly where public goods have tried to address caste or gender inequalities. Uh, if you look at the US, right, uh, it has done a very poor job in, uh, in racial inequalities because that is a key societal failure, the issue of racial inequalities, that goes back, of course, to its very, very founding. And here's the paradox about the universal franchise, right? Universal franchise will result in the state representing the interests of the median voter. But if it reflects the interest of the median voter, it will also reflect the social preferences, at least to some degree, on issues of caste or, or in India, race in the US of the median voter. If the median voter is not progressive, uh, why should we expect the state that reflects and is elected by the median voter to be particularly progressive either? Which is why I think uh, the Indian state is relatively better at providing hard goods such as roads or electrification than sanitation because human waste was seen as polluting uh, and restricted to the lower caste. 
it's better at raising food output fourfold in the last half century than improving malnutrition outcomes, which are affected by intra household you know, distribution. It is better at building schools than learning outcomes because what happens inside the classroom is affected by caste and gender. And on gender, we are better able to get girls to school, but unable to improve uh, 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 bad sex ratios, low and declining female labor force participation, or generalized societal violence against women. I'll uh, conclude here. Uh, broadly speaking, I think if we look forward, we, the Indian state. There are five great transformations that are going on uh, in India. There's a demographic, economic, political, social, and technological transformations. The question that I've tried to pose before you is state building at such large scales as India, nation buildings in very heterogeneous societies, doing both through democratic means. Have they ever been achieved simultaneously? And have they ever been achieved in 70 years? So how should we think about scale? So between 1994, quarter century, uh, 1994 to 2019, India added about 420 million people to its population. So we added more people in a quarter century than probably we had added the five millennia before independence. We added more people in 25 years than the entire population of the US in one, and that to in one third the land area. And yet, the weak state in India did manage to lift this massive demographic expansion to its highest growth rates uh, and the largest decline in poverty. And I think the question is how should you know, you know, development think about such demographic scales? in short, such short time scales. So this is sort of, sort of India, right? If you see the challenge of scale and heterogeneity, right? Uh, the state maps uh, reflect comparable countries, population for every state. And that, in a sense, the challenge is two things. Uh, both state building, nation building, and doing so in de democratic ways. Now, what we have seen is, I would argue, improvements in state capacity. We can now deliver things at scale. These are some government programs. We all know there are issues, problems with all of them. But I think there's no doubt that in the past 20 years, governments have been able to provide and do things that now, not for thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, but for tens of millions of people. That is distinctive than, than the past. Uh, I would argue that our apex institutions today, which used to be our strength and local uh, 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 line functionaries were weak, today perhaps the opposite is happening. Our apex institutions are weakening. Uh, there's been this trope of lazy, venal bureaucrats at the local level. I think it's less true now. Uh, the work culture is changing somewhat to the better. It's not great, but I'm just saying relative to the past. Even Corruption, we are moving from a sort of Bihar style to a Korea style corruption at the local levels. Uh, the, <clears throat> the Bihar style was there was a cost. You made money by, you know, mixing more sand with cement. So you had it was you made money through poor quality. And now it is cost plus, which is the Korean style. The quality is better. You make money through higher costs rather than poorer quality. So, so I think I'll end with this, that state effectiveness is increasing in its ability to scale up programs. State building has been manifest consequence of increasing physical connectivity, loads, electricity, transmission lines, optical fiber cable, et cetera. Connectivity between citizens and states, like Padar. Connectivity between firms and the state, like GST. On the other hand, I think nation building, for reasons that all of you, I'm sure, are aware, uh, I think is a much more questionable 
and a much more worrying issue that faces us as I look forward to the uh, to the sort of near near future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Kapoor. Uh, your lecture was so much aligned with the interest of uh, uh, both uh, Dr. Piga Kovalakrishnan and also the research interest here at the center. Uh, so now I'm throwing open the. Can you take a few questions until. Uh, Please. Yes. Uh, so uh, we have uh, about 20 minutes and thereabouts. Uh, uh, people could just unmute themselves and ask the questions. And if they are not able to, uh, they can put the question in the chat box and we will read, read that out for Yeah, Rishikesh has a, Rishikesh Malik has a question. Uh, Rishikesh, why don't you ask yourself? Hello. Um, can I read out? Uh, I think Rishikesh is not able to. Thank you for. I'm sorry. He's asking, what is your assessment on government effectiveness in Indian context when? Government is not able to spend much of its central government, much for its central government employees, not able to fill up various vacancies in government, and spends little percentages on education, health, and other development areas related to GDP. Besides, there are government failures in implementation of laws and order corruptions in government, bribe taking by officials. Is it not surprising to see India standing? better in terms of government effectiveness relative to other Asian countries and other countries like Brazil. Or there are other factors which holds India relatively in higher position in terms of government effectiveness. Uh, sorry, is the question about India's government effectiveness relative to other countries or? Yes, yes, I think, I think so. So, <laughs> So remember, uh, however poor we think our government is, other countries' people think that their governments are worse. Uh, so uh, the competition is not exactly spectacular. Uh, we think we have violence. Look what happens in Mexico and, and Brazil or South Africa. And then you begin to realize, wait a second. So I think one is about some absolute measure of performance, and the other is about relative. When you see an absolute measure, we can clearly see where the Indian state's performance is weak, altering, and for all the reasons out outlined, uh, uh, why it's not doing you know the better. But the fact is that worldwide. This is just much harder than we think, which is why when you look at uh, government effectiveness in other countries in Africa and <laughs> Latin America, et cetera, there too, uh, government effectiveness is very, very poor. Uh, so we do relatively better, not because we are great, but because they are bad. So that's the sense in which India does relatively. And I, that's why I wanted to give some, some comparative data to show that, look, uh, uh, yes, we have a tale of woe and we, you know, bemoan our state's performance. But it's not exactly that, you know, other countries are doing spectacularly. We, of course, know that East Asia and Southeast Asia, et cetera, are doing. And now uh, we are waking up to the fact that our neighbor Bangladesh has been doing, in some cases, much better. Than us. But overall, uh, it's not a very strong competition that other low income countries are doing fabulously. If they were, they would not be low income. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Any further questions? Can I can I ask one? Um, yes, yes, please. Um, hi, Devesh. This is Tirthankar Roy. Um, hi. hi, very well. Thank you. Um, this is a very interesting uh, talk, and I uh, uh, accept your uh, general take on uh, on on the failings and successes of the Indian state. Um, I'm just wondering. Uh, I mean, somewhere you mentioned the quality of education problem, and that's uh, that's a very serious uh, problem, of course, and it's partly a failing of the state. Um, how, where do you place it? I mean, is it a, a failing of the state building process, or is it a failing of the nation building process? I mean, where where I, I would imagine that where quality is poor, it's poor for all classes and all sections of people. Um, so, where exactly does it fit in in your argument? So, you know, uh, uh, I think the, if I see perhaps the, you know, we know now we are looking back and, and you've done work on this, but I think the thing that puzzles me most is the development strategy, as we know, we hear a lot about the 1950s, you know, the ISI model, state-owned enterprises, all of that. That has received planning, or that has received a, a, a lot of attention. I think the part that has received less attention and one that I don't quite understand is why we did not make universal primary education the first absolute priority in the 1950s because we had a broad political sensibility that had at least egalitarian uh, inclinations at least uh, recognized overall the importance of education we know that education primary education was a state subject meaning subnational the constitution but most of the states were congress from there. So why was education not a priority? I mean, even the state I grew up in, West Bengal, it had 30 years of communist government. You know, we compare Kerala, but Bengal had had uninterrupted. And yet, what did they do on primary education? Despite, so why that's the case? Uh, you know, now I think, you know, uh, Marian Wiener had this lovely book called The Child and the State in India, and you know, where the argument was put in about a caste hierarchy, said the upper caste really had no intention of allowing the uh, sharing or you know, uh, uh, giving the lower caste sort of the human capital that would make for a level playing field, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think there are good reasons to believe that that uh, uh, was, uh, was an important thing. But even now, right, even today, uh, one rarely sees a passion among any political lead in the political leadership to say that primary education is the starting point of a child's life. And if we get the base right, the other things could at least hopefully follow. But I just don't see that. And it doesn't matter whether you are the BJP, whether you are, you know, uh, the Congress, whether you are any political party. I mean, yes, there is thing about enrollment numbers. At least now we have provided access, but the quality issue is still uh, we do just a very very poor job, and we lack any serious political passion and commitment to the most basic starting point of an egalitarian society. Don't know the answer. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, can I ask uh, now questions? Please? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hi, Devish. Uh, thanks for that very, very uh, the extended and very, very a uh, lot of new, fresh ideas and brilliant uh, kind of presentation. I would like to uh, I have three questions broadly. I mean, one is that uh, your basic thesis about, I mean, let's talk about state building versus, you know, versus nation building. The social heterogeneity together with universal franchise. Okay, when uh, your, the idea is that the universal franchise was introduced at a level 
uh, in a at a level where the per capita income was very low and socially uh, the, uh, the society was highly heterogeneous so what does it say about the character of our quality of our uh, uh, democracy itself or the quality of the uh, state itself if you look at uh, if you combine social heterogeneity together with universal franchise i would imagine that would have led to a greater distribution or more even distribution of public goods that's what should have happened because everybody has a right everybody has vote so everybody becomes a constituency and there will be a lot more contestations and that on the whole will push the whole thing social heterogeneity will drive uh, the things towards uh, more or better distribution of public goods that's uh, one question so what does it talk about the character of our uh, democracy or the character of our state is it that we are a fractured multi class state like patrick heller has already described uh, so that the state is highly divided and it's all the time doing kind of compromises within itself and the resources are therefore distributed in a such a way that it doesn't actually uh, lead to creation of public goods uh, i mean the government is not spending on itself but it's spending on certain interest groups so they are actually confiscating all the is that something like that happening that's my first point uh, question uh, second was the lower level of uh, 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 this thing functionaries there's a fascinating chart that you showed comparing india china and um, uh the us which shows that in india the deployment of uh, persons the frontline functionaries we have i have discussed with you uh, this many times it's very low at a panchayat or a block downward level and that is cutting edge level of implementation so is that uh, i mean is that uh, i mean i would like to know some more views on that what could that be is it because i mean there's no dearth of employment there's no dearth of uh, demand uh, as far as i can understand from the people's Uh, side, for example, the NRG or something. So why is this uh, dichotomy, a dichotomy between, let's say, a federal level and a state level and a local level? Why is local level employment or deployment of personnel so low? The frontline function is so low. I mean, you have gone into uh, IITs and all that. If you talk about, let's say, nurses, ANMs, the village uh, uh, teachers, village teachers and all that, the, the numbers are very, very uh, few. that's my second uh, question what could be a broader explanation for that and third is the question of regional differences i mean we we can go on about that also india is a highly regionally diverse country but i'll take only two examples here one is that of kerala and tamil nadu if you look at kerala and tamil nadu in 1947 or around 1950 the distribution of public goods may have been much better in kerala compared to tamil nadu but uh, you know as a franchise was introduced in both the places but you find that kerala did well in terms of health and uh, education and all those outcomes welfare outcomes but tamil nadu did not do badly at all compared to india so tamil nadu was a society where the social heterogeneity was very high and um, the level of uh, distribution of public goods was highly uneven but because universal franchise came and a lot of interest groups came together the public goods uh, supply improved that's what i would imagine and same thing if you compare west bengal versus tamil nadu also same thing would obtain west bengal as you rightly point out is a highly mobilized state but the, the distribution of goods is not very high so if you i think go to some of the states i think there are more interesting uh, paradoxes emerge which we can probably uh, look at yeah thank you thanks uh, thanks would you uh... I, i as always you pose questions to me that i don't have very good answers uh... <clears throat> so look this uh, you know this whole when we say the state is is a divided well if society is divided that's the sort of argument right why should we be surprised that the state is is of divided it's uh, it would be very unusual if you had a very divided society and a very uh, a unified state after all the state is imperfectly in uh, uh to whatever extent but at least to some extent it is a reflection of society it is not independent of it is not a revolutionary state where it could be independent of society it's a democratic state and therefore the state has to reflect society that is what you know democracy is so if society is divided why would we expect the state not to be divided in a in in a in the with the democracy uh, i think the argument that that you know you would expect in a universal franchise you know that's been the puzzle that 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 voters demand certain public goods and the puzzle is the state then 
uh, should be providing them and we don't observe that at least to the degree we would expect or hope for in the Indian case. So my argument is that the state provides club goods. It provides groups for specific groups of people because they do not clamor for universal public goods. I mean, look at what's happening, what we see in agriculture. I mean, there's no demand for a universal public good in agriculture, like agriculture research, agriculture extensions that affects all farmers. We only want uh, loan forgiveness because that affects, and you know, by definition, the larger farmers will gain more. We want procurement. Again, the larger farmers gain more. Most farmers in India, there's no public procurement. Uh, so, but if you are spending hundreds of thousands of crores literally on loan waiver programs, by definition, you do not have that money for other companies. So, if you are spending 100,000 crores on fertilizer subsidies, well, it is that there's an opportunity cost of all fiscal resources. You know, it is rare to see. I mean, what is amazing about the East Asian development story is how. How limited were these subsidies? And, and by the way, their agriculture yields and productivities are much higher than India's. So, yes, there is a clamor. You can call it interest groups. Uh, I mean, but I think that the net result has been for the provision of club goods, which are captured by different, you know, either social groups or interest groups or a combination of two. But very, I think, now it's not the case that we have not been providing universal public goods. I think that has been included. I mean, uh, uh, the, yes, the quality of our education is low, but I think compared to 20 years ago, at least at a broad level, access is no longer an issue, which it was for uh, quality is now the issue. We did, I think, we've done a very good job in rural roads. That's a public good used by everyone, by definition. That's been, <clears throat> we've done that in electrification. Every village is electrified. And yes, we know the quality of electricity. Again, access is an issue. But by and large, I do think in the last 20 years, that that's why I stressed in my last slide this issue of connectivity. Physical connectivity is a core public good that has really improved in the last few decades. <clears throat> the harder thing, as I said, where the connectivity within society itself, within and between social groups, that's the task where I think which is going to be a much harder task because that seems to be framed. Mr. Kapoor, yes. can I ask one question? Please. The Shekhal Gupta. Yes, to Dr. Gupta. Okay. Uh, one very minor thing. In case of Bihar, though the number of government employees may be small, but one has to see the quality of government employees. Because here, third, fourth grade employees are more who are really not contributing to the productivity or administration. They are mainly chaprasis. They are deployed in the house of the IAS officers. So in terms of number, uh, it... Uh, it doesn't matter anything. Second uh, question is, I broadly agree with your uh, analysis of India as such and the problem of state building. But I think one to take into historical consideration of land revenue system. Now, if you see uh, South Indian states where Rajwari system was prevalent and their uh, governance level is much better than anywhere else. 
you have rightly said about Kerala and Bengal. In Kerala, uh, literacy was promoted by the, uh, the king of uh, 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 I mean, the 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 king uh, king of Travan Court. Uh, then the then other uh, uh, Christian groups, and it was also a Rajwadi system. But in Bengal, it was a permanent settle. Now most of the permanent settled states are not only backward; their governance level is also very poor, and it, that continues to be poor. Even in Bengal, for example, 30 years of communist rule has not brought about any change. And when Mamta came, the whole communist party collapsed like house of cards because they have not, they didn't build a strong structure. So I think while you, while I agree with your broad analysis, I would uh, request you to take the uh, land uh, system uh, into consideration because that is the key thing and that continues to be the problem. For example, in, in Punjab and other states, uh, there it was a Mahalwadi system. So their governance was much better. Uh, and last point, you have to take into consideration that the states the, that have done better are enforcement-centric state. People normally uh, keep enforcement, but in uh, in in place like Bihar or in northern Indian states. That culture is not there, enforcement culture. I just wanted to put this thing. Uh, I really like your brilliant presentation. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Gupta. I think uh, just to say that I think you're absolutely right that it's not just that the state is small in overall size, but the distribution of personnel within them with a, especially with a small head and middle and a very large, poorly trained tail on the lines that you've said in Bihar, that is clearly a big part of the weakness of, of, of the state. You're, you're right on the land thing, and this, this relates to the point that, uh, that, that Viju raised earlier. Look, I do think that, I think that history matters. History has cast a very long shadow. But I would be careful in saying that history is also destiny. I mean, if you look at, say, Punjab, Haryana, the same state, it gets broken up. Punjab was really at the top, right? But today you see Haryana is doing much better than Punjab. Punjab is locked into a political economy of agriculture that is making it very, very difficult for it to move away and build on its strengths on agriculture. So, so, you know, I think one of the things this relates also to, to Vijay's point is that in our local governments, it's not just the lack of personnel, but local governments absolutely do not use the taxing power they have. I mean, one of the most underutilized taxes in India that local governments have is the property tax. Land tax is basically a joke in rural India. That is the court's course, course asset. It is just not taxed. And of course, in urban India, property taxation uh, in parts where property is so highly value tax, and you would think it's a very progressive tax because, because of course, the rich have much more expensive property. But because local governments have been unwilling to tax and use their tax power, and they depend on the devolution of funds from the top, uh, they also do not have the ability to hire personnel on their own and do what 
uh, ostensibly at least the 73rd and 74th amendments appear to give them the power to do. Okay, I think uh, uh, Mr. Babu Jacob, who is the former Chief Secretary of Kerala, would like to make a very brief observation. Mr. Jacob, you can do that now. Please unmute yourself and Hello? Oh, he seems to have uh, he seems to have lost connection with him. Oh, so sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. I think uh, uh, that brings us to oh, Mr. Jacob is now unmuted. Uh, Mr. Babu Jacob, would you like to make your observation now? Well, I think this seems to be some problem with his connection. So, okay. Uh, so I, I think I take this opportunity to thank Professor Kapoor very much uh, because uh, he has uh, readily agreed to give this lecture and uh, and uh, and it's such a comprehensive and nice one, as I said before. And uh, I thank the family of uh, uh, Dr. P.K. Gobarakrishnan, represented by Dr. Leda, who is in the audience. Um, I, I thank the family for supporting CDS uh, with this lecture series. I thank all of you, and especially the CDS alumni who are pre were presenting the uh, audience. And uh, uh, we look forward to having Professor Kapoor in our midst when it's possible to have in-person activity uh, in, uh, in, in a, I suppose, in a few months from now. Sunil, even though you have uh, expressed the vote of thanks, <clears throat> may I jump in and ask one more question? Sorry. Why don't you ask that question uh, uh, later on? Okay. Because it's a bit late in the day. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, then. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we are concluding the meeting now. Thank you, Professor Mani. Thank you. Thank you.